Welcome to Green Building Matters, the podcast that matters for green building professionals. Learn insight in green buildings as we interview today's experts in lead and well. We'll learn from their career paths, war stories, and all things green, because green building matters. And now our host, and yes, he has every lead and well credential, here's Charlie Cicchetti! Welcome to the next episode of the Green Building Matters podcast. I'm Charlie Cicchetti, but today's going to be different. I'm going to get interviewed, and we've brought in my very good friend and colleague, Allison Laura, who's a sustainability maven and just does a tremendous amount of education and putting passion into all of the blog posts and the CE courses and everything she does when it comes to GBES. So Allison, tell everyone a little more about yourself. Hello, and thanks for having me here today, Charlie. Uh, Charlie and I met years and years ago. We were both in the green building industry, and Charlie is just such a rabid networker and great connector. We met, and he just wanted to connect with someone else who was passionate about green buildings, trying to be a, a mover and a shaker in our local Atlanta market. And it was just fate. We've been collaborating together ever since amongst, you know, many life changes. And we've just been focused on the same goal. And I think that is really what keeps our friendship strong and our business relationship stronger. So I'm excited to put Charlie in the hot seat today (laughs) and ask him some fun questions about why green buildings matter. And, and first, Allison, thank you for all of the lead projects you run for me and all of the education that you put out there and uh, look forward to everything else we have coming up. But yeah, let's get into the questions. I know you've got some tough ones for me today. <laughs> this is going to be fun. Awesome. So I want to start back in our college days. Charlie and I actually went to the same college, Go Jackets, Georgia yeah. Tech. And in the early 2000s, we didn't have the opportunity to pursue a degree in sustainability. LEED wasn't even taught in the College of Architecture where I studied. And so I'm curious, Charlie, how did you get introduced to sustainability? And then why did you decide to focus a business on green buildings? Yeah. So going way back to our time at Georgia Tech, we didn't know each other then, but we ran into each other shortly thereafter. Uh, First, loved my time at Georgia Tech. I grew up in the North Georgia mountains. And so just naturally being from a small town, there wasn't a lot to do. You got out to nature. And so, you know, luckily my my parents really influenced um, some early sustainability. My mom's from Oregon and they were early, of course, adopters of just recycling programs. You have to do it. But then you move to the deep south and it's like recycling. What is that? And, (laughs) And so I think, you know, I got some of that from my mom coming from Oregon. My dad's from New York, Chichetti, like spaghetti, and so the Italian family up there. But they ended up, uh, you know, in, in North Georgia, and uh, and that's where I really spent most of my time uh, growing up. Went off to Georgia Tech, uh, and you're right, those early programs, whether it was construction, building construction, or architecture, just, you know, LEED was just in its infancy, so yeah. we didn't see it yet. So I think some of it was just how I was brought up, being resourceful. And then I really got into LEED. After I got out of Georgia Tech, I worked for a very large general contractor here in the southeast, uh, Batson Cook Company. Great contractor, built a lot of buildings uh, across the southeast. And I started off in estimating, then project management. Uh, After Batson Cook, though, I worked for a large real estate developer. So when I left Batson Cook, a general contractor, a hard bid general contractor, it was either I could start learning more about LEED or start learning more about BIM. Those were the two hot topics in kind of the mid-2000s in the construction world. And uh, uh, honestly, at the time, I, I didn't do as much with LEED. But when I went to Opus Corporation, who was a top three real estate developer in the entire country, that's where everything that Opus was doing around that time uh, was going for a LEED certification. And that's where I first got into my early LEED projects. Okay, great. So you kind of saw some hands-on construction development and I guess just got excited about it and decided to to run forward with it. I'm curious though, so I think you're a bit of a risk taker. You started a business in an emerging industry like 
you got to have a lot of confidence to do that. Where, where does that confidence come from? Sure, Allison, uh, calculated risks. But, um, you know, I'm an optimist. I think you and I share that in, in common. You know, yeah, I, I've been very fortunate to help grow two green building firms really during a recession. Actually, we're, we're started uh, right there in, in the recession. So, you know, SIG's been around for eight and a half going on almost nine years. GBS just celebrated 10 years in business, helping everyone pass lead exams, now well exams. So uh, I've been blessed. I'm fortunate. But um, the green building industry was going strong even throughout the recession. So I would say I knew I didn't want to do just normal construction when I left Opus Corporation, me and a co-founder. And um, you know that's really where we're like, okay, lead. We need to teach. We need to help people pass these exams so they can navigate this kind of crazy market right now because of what's going on in construction and, and a lot of layoffs and everything that was going out there. So we had a lot of fun early on flying around the United States, teaching lead classes. Way back then, it was lead uh, new construction version 2.2. We were teaching a lot on that exam before lead version 3 rolled out there in June 2009. So uh, flying around, doing trainings across the country, had built up quite the kind of lead consulting repertoire as well. But that, those were those early days, I would say, uh, calculated risk to go ahead and get into the lead training and then lead consulting side of things. Luckily, uh, that was the right move to make and, and really helped us grow the companies uh, even during the recession. And now that the economy is good, I'm happy to report we're, we're able to grow even more. It's been fantastic. That's awesome. Yeah, I've seen nothing but growth from both of your companies. So it seems like if it was any type of risk at all, it certainly has paid off. So, uh, Charlie, you've been a great mentor to me in my career. And I'd like to learn about what kind of mentors you've met along your way. Well, I mean, first, I'm a fan of of learning. And uh, I mean, I love business books and podcasts and and I'm in mastermind groups, and I love to talk business, small business, mm-hmm. and growth. And but, but mentors, you're right. And this is a great question. To go back to when I first got into uh, construction, uh, there were a couple of folks at Bats and Cook. I want to call out Mark Dye was the chief estimator at Bats and Cook. Really taught me estimating, and 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 really invested time in me, so I could understand quantity takeoffs, and I could understand how to read construction documents and blueprints and specifications. And, and that just set me up for everything else I did later in construction. Even now, uh, even though my team doesn't want me on as many lead projects, if I need to go and look at some documents, of course, it's, it goes back to those early days with Mark Dye on the estimating. Uh, Bob Duma at Bats and Cook tapped me to run some projects in, uh, in some condo buildings that were being built. And so that gave me some, I was the young professional, the go-getter that just wanted the sky's the limit. And he saw that and invested time in me. So a couple early mentors in, uh, on the construction side, that really helped. But then you fast forward all the way maybe to today, I think some mentors, and it's, it's important for everyone listening to understand, is they're not always someone that you work with or someone you have access to. It could be just someone that you want to model after. You really like the way they've gone about some life best practices or work best practices. So there's definitely some authors and some influencers that I follow, and, uh, and I try to mimic some of what they do. I like how you say a mentor doesn't have to be someone you work with or interact with because some of us struggle with trying to find those people in our day-to-day life, but perhaps just seek out influencers, people you can look up to as a more of a role model. I think that's great advice. Uh, Speaking of role models, GBES, I know the mission is to help people advance their careers and really you know, advance that and give them some career coaching. Do you see GBES as a career coach? Yes, I think so. I think that's something we're striving to do even more of. We want to help people not just pass an exam, study for that really hard exam and get those letters after your name. Hopefully that gives you that that promotion, that raise, that, hey, now you get to run that next project. Or maybe you're answering, you're asking and answering questions more on your projects. But to check in. How do you have these conversations as the green building systems change? Uh, you know, what resources are out there for me to learn more? And, and so our goal as a company, you know, now that I've been tasked to really run the company over the last few years at GBES and GBES.com is, Allison, it's, uh, we want to be that resource throughout your green building career. We don't want it to be a one and done. We absolutely want 
to have blog posts and podcasts like this, just, hey, I didn't think of it like that. It's a common denominator that we're going to help you. We know how to pass these exams. That's what we've been doing for 10 years. We're going to help you pass lead exams. And now that really tricky, well, AP exam, but we want everything in between. So uh, some of the best interactions I have with our customers at GBS are those that reach out and have not only passed an exam, but are asking for some career advice. Hey, I'm thinking of applying to this company or, uh, you know, now that I've got this, like, you know, do you have any insight? And yeah, absolutely. We're going to make the time for that. So I'd like to think that we're doing a good job with that, but we want to do a lot more of that, kind of be that career coach throughout your green building career. That's a really exciting idea. And I see that that's where our passions really intersect is that we both care about people and we want our community to know that GBES cares about you too. The next topic I want to dig into is some of the the jargon and terminology, right? So the the movement we're all part of got started with this idea of greening things up or making things more sustainable. And now the buzzwords people are talking about are resilience and wellness. And so this is just, you know, kind of a theoretical, hypothetical question like is it still the same spark of change? Are we a- or are we aiming at a new goal? Can you speak to maybe like what is this movement moving towards? You know, and there's some of us that have been doing this for quite some time. Um, the only lead credential I have, Alice, that I don't have is uh, is lead fellow because you have to really have been in this industry for eight or ten years or more. And so, uh, for the record, I'm, I'm I've got my eyes on that one one day, but. So I think there's those that have been in the green building movement for several years and, and there maybe they, they need a new spark. So maybe they have a new goal. Um, But I think it boils down to who is in your circle of influence. If you're a very high up real estate professional and you're going to be building buildings all over the world, you really can affect the resources used across a large scale of materials, the energy efficiency of those buildings, like you have influence over, how those buildings that are meant to last for 30, 40, 50, hopefully a lot longer years. And so I think those have been doing it a while. Maybe, maybe it's, uh, maybe it is a new target, but nothing excites me more, Allison, than someone that comes to the green build conference and they're getting into sustainability just now. They've been sent to learn about lead. Someone that comes to our website or takes one of our classes and they're new to this. I mean, that really excites me. So that that's the same spark in my opinion, which is, there are still so many people, especially international customers, because the U.S. Green Building Council is really trying to grow even more internationally, which is great. It's great for the world. I think that's some of the same. It's get into this movement, understand the programs, understand what do you have influence over, ask tougher questions, ask better questions. So I hope I'm answering it, but those have been doing it a while. I think we do need to set our sights on a new target and have hope that, you know, it's not like we're going to run out of resources tomorrow. It's we got some catching up to do as a society. We've got some catching up to do that we've kind of engineered ourselves into the position we're in with the buildings that aren't as efficient as they should be. And um, especially in developing countries too, you know, the U S had a head start and, and we didn't get here based on solar power the whole way. We've used our fair share of fossil fuels to become the, the you know, major economy that we are. So I uh, hope I'm answering that, but I think it's two parts. Some are just getting into it. That same spark that you and I found many years ago, I think they can still kind of hang on to. Those who have been doing it for a while, just know that uh, you might want to just check who do you have influence over and, uh, and create a new target. I'm hearing that maybe we're not all aiming for the same thing and that's okay. You know, there's still a lot of people need to get that groundswell paradigm change of bringing sustainability into mainstream. And then we also have people like you and I who have been in it deeply for years. And now we are perhaps inventing the new paradigm, setting those new trends. And they're both exciting places to be because what I see that it all has in common is just making this world a safer, more enjoyable place. And that's where well and fit well and the word resiliency that that starts to get us excited because yeah. you know what those make sense now there's new rating systems and uh and, and that's some some new excitement great 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 
So I know that you are a father, a very proud father, and I'm curious, how does being a father affect the urgency of your professional work in doing less harm to the earth? It's funny when you go to the kindergarten class and you read the book about recycling because you're the green guy when it's, uh, you know, bring your dad to work day and and, uh, kids say the darndest things. They'll raise their hand and they'll be like, yeah, I saw mommy throw stuff in the trash that should have been recycled. So, um, (laughs) You know, it, it goes back to some influence. Um, I, I want to participate there more with, with the boys in their school. But, uh, yeah, I've, I'm raising three boys with my wife, Latrice. And uh, we do, even though it sounds cliche, it's it's something that really uh, I hang on to is I want the world to be a better place for them because, um, you know, we've got a lot of population growth. And, and it's just a little scary when you look at the, the macro side of, wow, look what we as a, as a world are on pace for. So not doom and gloom here today, Allison, but I'd say I want to make sure that, that they understand sustainability and, and what they can do, even just turning off the lights, even just, you know, really doing a good job with recycling, you know, composting, just, you know, asking questions of, of their friends at school. What are they doing? Uh, and those are just a few basics. But uh, health and wellness is something we've been focused on with a, as a family for a while. And, um, and so that's an exciting topic to have with, with kids. Uh, something we do in our companies, though, is then we look at middle school and high school. And, and so you just have to look at each stage uh, in each age group and just see, you know, what can they relate to? And if they show interest, you kind of pour into that. But to answer your question, I'd say, yeah, it definitely weighs on me as a father that I want to make sure I didn't sit back. And instead, I, I tried to make this a better place for them. And I can see that. I think you're doing a great job by just staying engaged at every level. So that's really awesome. Another thing that I really recognize you about, Charlie, is you're always encouraging people to do their best. And you're always recommending really interesting little, you know, business psychologies and books and and ideas to be productive, to stay focused and I really appreciate all that motivation and I'm sure you've got some more tips and tricks up your sleeve. So I'm curious, what kind of routines or rituals do you have to help you be successful day to day? It's taken me a while. Um, and, and I, I'm a, a student of, of, you know, just productivity. And, uh, I think just everyone, no matter what profession you're in, you're asked to do more with less. And, and that is that one resource that we can't uh, get more of is, is time. So I like to, quote, hack time. I like to find ways to, quote, buy time. And so, you know, as I, you know, uh, am able to, I, I want to invest there. Where can I maybe buy back some time, so to speak? Um, and we can talk more about that. But I would say, um, you know, visualize your day. I mean, this is something I coach my teams on. You and I have talked about it is is make sure you don't just plan out your, your week or you become a really good planner. I think everyone needs to, and I'm not great, but I'm, I'm decent at it, is to be a good planner, but visualize your day. So one thing I do, Allison, is, uh, you know, if I'm thinking about tomorrow, um, you know, like tonight, I'm going to go ahead and visualize, okay, what has to happen tomorrow in what order? And then tomorrow morning, uh, when I wake up early, I'm going to prime myself for, okay, here's how I want the day to go. I've got to get this done, get that done. I've got those meetings Oh, but don't forget about that on the way home. And if I just kind of visualize it, you're just talking to yourself. Mm -hmm. Uh, I usually, the night before, will think about the next day. And then that morning, early, how do I want, if it's in my control, how do I want the day to go? You know what? Not every day is going to do it, but your subconscious is going to kind of put on some training wheels and it's going to keep you on track. And, you know, if you get eight out of 10 things done on your to-do list, hopefully you're the kind of person that the half, the glass is half full and you're going to say, you know what? That was a heck of a day. And I'm really less stress, less headspace was used to decide on what should I work on. It makes it easier to say no. And mm. so I think when you visualize your day, when you visualize your week, here's really how this flows. I need to be intentional about it. It's easier to say no to some things that sneak in or you say, no, not now. You put that on the radar, on the radar list. I'll get to that later. Um, you'd be honest with people that are really asking for and demanding your time. But visualizing, I think, is something that's really helped me over the last few years. Um, that's one. I use uh, Trello as an organization tool for, for kind of my to-do list, my projects, and my progress on projects. I do live by religiously my calendar. I think that's something several we've interviewed on the podcast is, you know, if you're a busy person in your personal life and your professional life, 
you, you know, you schedule things. And, and if you don't schedule it, it's, it's probably not going to be a priority and get done. So uh, I put my personal and my work things all in one calendar. I sync it up. I use Outlook. And uh, even though I know most of the GPS team uses G, uh, Google Calendar, I use Outlook. And uh, so between Trello, everything on Outlook, and I color code it, personal, you know, work things, travel, just visualizing my day. So trying to stay organized. And it really boils down to, again, the word is intentional. I'm a pretty busy person. And I, I think it happens to you, Allison, and I'm sure many of those listening. If you don't fill up your schedule how you want it, it's going to fill itself up with other people's stuff, with things that maybe aren't as important. And uh, so just be super intentional and protect your time, block out time and, and fight to the death, protect that time. If you've got to get that thing done, you've heard me say it before, but I love the quote, uh, eat the frog first thing in the morning, mm-hmm. uh, Mark, Mark Twain. So mm-hmm. get that thing you're putting off, get it done first thing in the morning, uh, eat that frog. Or I've kind of reversed it a little bit. And I say, uh, I want to get that one big thing for my week done on a Monday morning. And I just, then the rest of the week, hopefully is a win if I truly did protect that time. So it's all going to sound good. Um, I haven't perfected this yet, but I've been very intentional about my time and that's how I can get a lot done. I can attest to that. One thing you've coached me on is take that biggest, scariest assignment, do it first thing before you you get distracted with other stuff. Don't multitask, knock it out of the way. And there is so much satisfaction in that. So that, that's a great lesson that you taught me. And I just want to reiterate again, the visualization and intention, such powerful tools for manifesting anything you want in life. So that's, that's awesome. Charlie, do you want to be known for any type of specialty or like natural talent or gift? If, if we were to talk about your legacy, what, what are you going to be known for? Uh, it's a great question. Two things come to mind, Allison. One is um, a friend that's very close to me said, I'm very resourceful. And, you know, maybe that comes from a very humble upbringing in the North Georgia mountains. Maybe that comes from just, just my path and my career, and, but just resourcefulness. And I think that's uh, just just some grit and having a knack. So, you know, it's not one of those that it's, it's always a pat on the back. It's just a, not everybody has it. And so that's something that you can sharpen. But resourcefulness. Um, so in any situation I'm in, I think, you know, I, I ask my team, I say, have we exhausted all efforts? You know, let's just, uh, let's say it's a lead project and there's a lead reviewer going back and forth with you. Maybe we're one or two points away from gold. Have we exhausted all efforts? And, you know, have you thought about it this way? Have you thought about it like this? And, and so I think that's something I have confidence. You hit on it earlier in everyone. I always look for the best in, in everyone. Honestly, Allison, I guess that would be my one thing is I look for the best in everyone. But at the same time, I'm going to say, have you exhausted all efforts? And um, I think sometimes people think they're tapped out and, and they haven't thought about it a little bit different way. So there's many lead projects that we've been able to get there because we just looked at it a little differently. So I think the team likes to be challenged like that. Resourcefulness, looking for the best in, in people. I love to teach, actually. I didn't know this. You know, because I, I worked, I got out of school at Georgia Tech, and I worked in construction as an estimator, then a project manager. And then I worked in real estate as a project manager, got into lead, and then I became a lead consultant. But then I became a lead trainer. And Allison, I actually really love to teach. Even I, I've taught a lead green associate, full day, eight-hour prep class, hundreds of times. I don't know, maybe a thousand. I haven't added it up. I still love to teach it. And I still have the same corny jokes to try to get my point <laughs> across with each of those lead credits. So love to teach. And But that's an example of even where I'm at in my career, I still want to invest my time and, and some money to become an even better teacher. And I want to get on stage more and I want to be a speaker. Um, I want to get outside of my comfort zone and not just teach the topics I know best. But um, kind of moving towards, I really like to teach. I get some pretty positive feedback there. I would definitely agree with that. You're a great teacher, and I think it's connected to your your skills of resourcefulness because you can find a way to communicate it to a person that they're going to be able to relate it. And on top of that, I think both of those things make you a great problem solver. You know, one thing we're trying to encourage our team is to ask for more feedback and you are a great person to always give that honest feedback in a positive way and 
teaching, you know, subtly teaching that, that whole way. So it's fun working with you. Thank you. <laughs> Next, I want to know about what books you're reading, or maybe you listen to them on audiobooks. What's inspiring you these days? Sure. Yeah. And so sometimes I read, sometimes I listen. So I definitely am a fan of Audible and I do 1.5x. So I really can blow through some books. Some of my friends in my my mastermind group. What does that mean? It reads uh, it faster? Speed. Yeah, it reads it faster. Oh, wow. Um, so some do it at two, but that's too much. So I Ooh. do one and a half speed. And um, I, I really do like the, the business books, the productivity, the, the self-improvement, because then I'll distill out what do I want to try, and then I'll roll that out to the, to the two teams. Um, so a couple things come to mind. One is um, a book called The 12-Week Year by Brian Moran. This is just a, a great book that has some tools with it that really show how in 12 weeks you could get more done in 12 weeks than most people get done in a year. It's just being what we talked about earlier, super intentional, have a good plan, stick to the plan, do it in this order. It's not subjective. Are we on track? Are we not on track? It's right there in front of you. So 12 week year, Brian Moran. And then this one's uh, fairly new, Tim Ferriss. I'm a fan of Tim Ferriss, Tribe of Mentors. And so we mentioned mentors. Uh, Tim Ferriss, who wrote the four hour Work week, the four hour body, four hour chef, tools of titans is a good one. But this one, tribe of mentors, he emailed a uh, hundred influential people throughout the world that he's connected to in some way. Maybe they were on his podcast or through a friend of a friend and uh, really distilled some powerful questions down into okay, maybe you don't have access to this, you know, hedge fund investor, one of the people that interviewed, but uh, here's how that person answered these questions. So, if you were at that coffee shop with a true mentor that you have access to, uh, instead dive into his book, Tribe of Mentors, and uh, I think you can just get some nuggets. I like books like that because you don't have to read the whole thing cover to cover. You can literally just open up anywhere in the book and just take it person at a time. Maybe one day you get inspired by someone two or three pages worth of, wow, I might take action on that. Tribe of Mentors. Well, and I like that you read these books and then share the tips with me and save me time. So hopefully that's what people are getting out of this podcast too, is this is, you know, the fast track to being a green building leader. Uh, So closing up here, I know that you are a big fan of the bucket list. I don't know how many items are on your bucket list that aren't crossed off yet. Can you speak a little bit about like why did you start a bucket list? Why is it important to keep up? And what are you going to cross off this year? Uh, yeah, I am. I uh, have a, a business coach, Tim Fulton, who has been helping me for a while. I'm in uh, Vistage, which is a, a CEO group. And um, uh, three or four years ago, Tim Fulton, he said, uh, you know, Charlie, you need a bucket list. And I'm like, Tim, I was a smart aleck. Mm-hmm. I said, uh, Tim, don't you think I'm too young for a bucket list? Mm-hmm. You know what? The next day, Allison, I sent Tim an email with 10 bucket list items. Since mm-hmm. then, I've built it out to about 100 110 just experiences. And so my goal is to do about five a year. It's not like you stop everything. And, and you know, this is over the course of your life. What do you think uh, really resonates with you? Would be fun, would be positive, just something to work towards. Some things on my bucket list that Allison, I could do at any time, but they might cost a little money. You know, one of them is sit courtside at a at an NBA game. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm gonna wait for the right time for that one. But uh, some others uh, last year in twenty 20- 17, I did an Olympic triathlon. I had trained for that for That's six huge. months and I did the triathlon. So that was one last year. Um, really, really was proud of that accomplishment. But you go through my bucket list and, and I just, you know, I've got them categorized sports, adventure, travel, family, business, health, and then there's miscellaneous. But I, I would say, I think it is important for everyone to not just have goals that are three months out, six months out. Um, have a bucket list. What excites you just about life and, uh, and put it to paper and work towards it. So yeah, for me this year, I, I hope to do another, say five items on the bucket list. I usually highlight maybe 10 and the five of those uh, are able to fall into place. I'm all about it. Sounds like that ties back into some of your hacking tips about visualization and intention. If you don't write it down and imagine yourself doing it, then it's not going to happen. And, and those you know, small little things get you closer to it. And some of mine coming up will be some international travel. Uh, honestly, I haven't done a lot of international travel, but I'm looking forward to going to Europe, hopefully maybe some speaking opportunities there. So that's going to be exciting this year. 
that, that's one that really stands out. Um, cool. Yeah. That'll be fun. Tell me about the greenest building you've ever stepped foot in. Well, I've been fortunate, Allison, to work on several really cool projects, but one uh, that we had access to is uh, it's out in Golden, Colorado. So it's just west of Denver. And um, so Golden, Colorado, it's the National Renewable Energy Lab, NREL, and that's part of the Department of Energy. They literally test solar panels and test wind turbines there. It's like one of the coolest campuses you can come across. And so um, this was a while ago. We were teaching a class, and we got a tour there. But this is a LEED Platinum, net zero building. And the computer system, the building automation system, if the weather is going to be a certain way that day, it will not turn on the mechanical ventilation. It will automatically open windows. They even have like a labyrinth where they pre-cool some of the air before it's delivered. Um, the underfloor air distribution, they had to put in white noise because people, since it had radiant heat and radiant cooling, people were like, I don't even hear the air flowing. So they put in <laughs> white noise to make people think that the air is flowing and the air condition is not busted. Okay. So next thing you know, lead plat of net zero, uh, just a fantastic building out there. Uh, in Colorado. Really, really fun to tour that project. That's exciting. Sounds like a good one. What advice do you wish you had received earlier in your career? Yeah, no, this is a good one. I mean, whether you're working for a small business, a medium or a large, I kind of have two parts when I think of that question, Allison. One is, uh, you know, the company wants to invest in you because they're going to get a payback on you. So if you want to get on the committees and volunteer and go to the conference, speak up. Um, and, you know, maybe you do need to pitch, hey, here's what I'm going to bring back to the company. So ask. Never hurts to ask. Okay. That's kind of one part of it. I mean, the other part of it is, and this will sound a little sleazy at first, but fake it until you make it. Oh. And, um, and so what I interpret that as and how I've used that in my career is have confidence. Who better to do that than you? And you got to have some confidence. So sometimes you do need to fake it till you make it, but... Um, you got to get a certain level of experience maybe to win that big project. But are you confident that you would be able to do it? Who better to do it than you? Uh, you have to have some confidence along the way. Okay. I think that helps in everything in life, right? Absolutely. So finally, what words of encouragement do you have for anyone that may be hesitant to jump into the green building movement? Sure. You, you might think that uh, it's too late. Uh, LEED's been around 17 years, and, and it's not. I mean, here at GBES, Allison, where you and I work, is there are so many people every single week, every single month that are just now coming around to LEED. It's super exciting. It keeps us uh, on our toes, and we want to continue to deliver fresh content. What's going on with the Green Building Movement today? Because it's different than five years ago. So I think it just in general is it's not too late. Uh, definitely get a credential. Because there are only there are only so many credential holders in the world for LEED, for WELL, for all these different programs. So get a credential because that does give you validation that you know more than someone without that credential. You would be a good LEED project manager, for example. So get a credential, at least a LEED grant associate, and you know just make sure it's not too late. Get out there and say, you know what, maybe I'll have access to projects through my company, but if I won't, I'm going to go volunteer. And I'm going to go talk to my friends that work at such and such architect. And I'm going to find a way that I can get exposed to see more of the ins and outs of how this program works. I'm glad to hear it's not too late because green buildings still matter. Absolutely. Allison, thanks for interviewing me. This was a nice flip-flop on the podcast <laughs> today. Fun. But, um, you know, we really appreciate you listening. And Allison, you're a great interviewer. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Green Building Matters podcast. At GBES.com, our mission is to advance the green building movement through best-in-class education and encouragement. Remember, you can go to GBES.com slash podcast for any notes and links that we mentioned in today's episode. And you can actually see the other episodes that have already been recorded with our amazing guests. Please tell your friends about this podcast. Tell your colleagues and if you really enjoyed it, leave a positive review on iTunes. Thank you so much, and we'll see you on next week's episode.